for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill your lost demands. Could my zeal no respite? No my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone you must save and you alone you must save and you alone nothing in my hand I bring Simply to the cross I cling, desperate come to see your face, helpless look to you for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me Savior or I die, wash me Savior. close in death when I soar to worlds unknown and see you upon your throne rock of ages clap for me let me hide myself in thee let me hide myself in Myself in thee, let me hide myself in Child of God. 
Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I trust you're singing that today, church, and you're saying that where you're at, and if you don't, Remember it. Be reminded of that today. You are God's child. He has the power to raise the dead, the God who brings life out of death. It's the call of the church. It's the response to who he is. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Join us as we read together from the Psalms about rejoicing in him. Psalm 9 and Psalm 66. Rejoice in him. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed a stronghold in time of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Come, let us rejoice in him. Thing 
Medical Missionary Care Month and you can help cover the cost of the missionaries health care which costs over 2.9 million dollars per year and we did purchase a memorial roll um, for Beth Madison and uh, you can donate to the medical plan by putting medical plan in your memo thank you I'm Pastor Steve. We at Big Blast Ministries wanted to create something that was fun and exciting for children of all ages to learn about Jesus while they are safe at home. So we came up with Kids Blast. What is Kids Blast? Let's find out. Kids Blast has illusions, object lessons, fun science experiments, Bible stories told with balloons. We release these episodes every Sunday at 10 o'clock, but you can watch them any time in the week. You just need to go to Big Blast Ministries on Facebook or on YouTube to catch all of our videos. God bless. Have a great week. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a great Sunday. It's Pastor Chelsea. And I hope you enjoyed the beautiful weather that we got this week. And I just want to give you a couple of announcements for this morning. The first one is we still have youth group and Bible study on Wednesday nights. So this Wednesday, Pastor Jeff's going to be going through Acts 1 through 9. And youth group will be fun, Jesus, and games. We're so excited. And we still have Sunday school on Sunday mornings for teens and adults. We hope that you're plugging into our Sunday services like you are right now. And we'd love for you to share them and invite a friend. Thanks for plugging into Chelsea Naz Worship. And we can't wait to gather with you soon. Would you join me in praying with the offering and then singing the doxology with me? God, thank you so much for all the gifts that you've given our church. And thank you so much for the ways that our people give so faithfully, even in a time when things are crazy and a little bit scary. Would you protect all of our people today, our community? And God, would you just bless this offering? Thank you for our faithful givers and our faithful church members. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen.
Today's reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord.
It's funny, every, every place else in the service, Dale at the uh, audio video booth has had things clicking along so smoothly. This is the longest break we have in the service for me to get from the piano up to the pulpit. Um, one announcement I'll make to you before we uh, get into the scripture today. Uh, your church board meets Tuesday night, and I'm guessing uh, one of the topics on the agenda will be how quickly do we begin to open up the building and... Uh, and what kind of steps do we take as we do that? So would you be praying for us? Um, just a reminder, your church board is um, Dale Lear, uh, Abby Stark, um, Wendy Cole, uh, Janet Rayburn, Jan Fleming, Scott McElrath, Matt Barnes, Michael Quinn. And I serve as ex officio. Your pastor is automatically on that, on that board. So pray for us as we meet uh, Tuesday evening at 6.30. Uh, what a great image of a God who is mighty to save everyone, everywhere. That's his mission. That's his goal. And so to accomplish, accomplish his mission, he sends people. Um, just like he sent. He sent his son. And I was thinking about that this week um, when I came across a reading that said 40, 42% of Americans have a passport. Um, so a little under half of us have a passport, which is a massive change. Um, in 1990, only 4% of us had passports. Um, now, I don't have mine currently, and a number of you don't, but um, I was thinking, what would it be like if we could go anywhere we wanted to go? And this is an interesting time to ask that question, right? Um, when there are limits to where we can go and who we can be with. And some of you are thinking, we can't go anywhere. What a time to talk about a passport. The kids can't go to school. Many of us can't go to work. Um, we can't, in some cases, even leave our, our home um, for, for much of the variety we used to experience. I know my friends at Silver Maples are really limited right now to their own, their own place. They can't go to the, the public areas, even in the building. And when we do go out, it's weird, isn't it? Uh, if you put on a mask... Um, now you're looking at who has a mask on and who doesn't. You're beginning to kind of think about who's wearing a bandana or mask. And if they are wearing something over their face, you can't see their facial expression. And if someone coughs, everyone's looking over their shoulder to see who did that and should they be out. And we get suspicious. What did they touch? And do I have sanitizer close by? It's easy to retreat in our, into our own little world. But it's not just easy now. It's always easy to retreat into our own little world but especially during times like this. And the thing that strikes me is that's not the gospel, to, to, to retreat into your own world exclusively. Um, we don't serve a God who is shown to retreat into God's own self. God, in God's nature as Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, is a communal being. And then God doesn't stop there. The good news of the gospel is that this is a God who takes off all the benefits of being God, puts on a life and a body of a person, a human being, and then comes close to us. This is the story of a God who goes, a God who is on a mission. So whether you have a passport or not, if this is your God, if Jesus is your Lord, your Master, your Savior, you follow him and you go like he would go. So my question to you is this, who will you encounter today? 
Who will you encounter this week? This story of a God who goes, who invites us on a journey, picks up a chapter of it here in Acts. Paul is on a mission. Back in Acts 15, Paul had been sent by the church. By the way, we've talked about it a lot, but, but let's be reminded today, the church is not a building. When I say Paul was sent by the church, I don't mean the steeple and the glass and the doors said, Paul, go. It was the people, the called out ones, the ecclesia, the called out people who sent Paul. And so he was a, a sanctuary, as you sang about earlier, a, a moving, walking, talking, two-footed sanctuary. He took the Spirit of God wherever he went. And so he went to see the people in Thessalonica, and there was trouble there. And he went to Berea, and they were excited to hear the word and receive the word and compare what he said to what they saw in the scripture. They were excited in Berea to hear what Paul had to say until the people of Thessalonica showed up because they heard what was happening in the next city he went to, and they go there and they cause him trouble. And so several times in Acts 15, 16, 17, Paul has to be snuck out, sometimes under the cover of darkness, to to, to go like an underground railroad type of, of escape. And now Paul finds himself in Athens, and he didn't really, it seems, at least from the story that we read, he didn't seem to go there intentionally to serve as a missionary. Matter of fact, Dr. Luke tells us in his writing of the Acts of, Apo the, Apost uh, the, Acts of the Apostles that what Paul is doing here is waiting. He's waiting for his team, his missionary team, to catch up with him. And yet, while he's on this waiting moment, he's still a person on a mission. When I was a kid, I thought about missions and missionaries, and I thought of the jungle, Africa, someplace far away on a plain or across the ocean where they speak a different language and have a different culture. Well, I've come to rethink the image in my mind. The jungle isn't necessarily the place, and... Mission doesn't have to be far away, but you may be speaking to people in a different language. You know what that's like. Uh, there was a conversation taking place this week on Facebook in a group I'm a, a part of, and usually I just kind of sit back and watch these conversations happen. And at one point, there was a disagreement. You see, this particular group has rules set up, and one of the rules is there will be no political discussion, no political statements. And so one person was initiating a conversation, and somebody else said, that's political. And by the way, have you ever noticed, oftentimes the people who complain about things being political are people who don't like what's being said? Anyway, um, they were discussing whether or not this was a political post, and they were just kind of missing on the definition of what's political. And so the definition was thrown up there, and now they could have a conversation. Two people in the same group Speaking English and yet speaking different languages, you've been there. Maybe in the same household, in the same marriage. Uh, maybe it's with a parent or with a child or a, a brother or sister. You're talking, this, you're using the same words, but you're not connecting at all. Two very different conversations in one place between two people. While Paul is waiting, he sees their culture and he sees their religion and verse 16 says he was distressed. He was provoked. He was irritated. He was quite possibly angry. Have you seen things this week that have caused you to get stirred up inside, to make you angry, to think this is not right, to think this is not the way things are supposed to be, to think there's more to the story than this, or there's a better way? Well, Paul had those thoughts. What do you do when you experience that? Here's what Paul did, verse 17. It tells us he, the one word can be translated disputed, or preached, or reasoned, or spoke to them. Now, now think about those four different translations of the one word. Depending on where you go in scripture, sometimes it's disputed. Sometimes it's preached. Sometimes it's reasoned with. Sometimes it's speak to. My guess is, whoever's listening today to this, you have one of those that probably fits pretty comfortably. And you have one or two that you think, that's not me. To dispute, to preach, to reason, to speak. Get inside yourself for a moment. How were you made? What is your strength? Is it to dispute with people? 
Is it to preach to them? Is it to reason with them? Is it to speak with them? We pick up our story in verse 22. Notice what Paul does when he's finally ready to talk. He doesn't start in his talking. He doesn't start with God. And in his talking, he doesn't start with himself. He starts with his hearers. And he says things like, I see, you're very religious. And I went and I looked at all of these religious artifacts and places you have. And I found that you have a monument to an unknown God. And what is unknown to you, now I proclaim to you. Do you, do you see what's happening here? Uh, theologians use the word exegete. They're not the only ones, but he exegetes their culture and life. It's a great word. Say it. I, if you were here, I'd get to hear you say it. But where you're at, say the word exegete. What's going on? Paul sees what they're doing, and then he reads out of that. Paul says, I see, I've looked carefully at your objects of worship. He gets now outside of himself. He was getting inside himself as he's thinking about how to speak to them, but, he get, but first he gets outside of himself to see where they are at and what they are worshiping. He gets into the life and the neighborhood of those around him. Where do you go to see references in the world of people you live with? You know, it's a lot less work to just stand on one side of the street and yell at people. It doesn't take a lot of work to do. It's a lot less work to cut and paste a scripture or a quote and chuck it at somebody like a verbal grenade. Getting into the life and the head and the heart of someone else is hard work. But can I tell you, as a rule, it's the most effective way to be a part of change of transformation. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. Uh, you know the story of Jonah and the whale. Um, Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh, and God says, go to Nineveh, and Jonah runs away, and God says, no, go to Nineveh, and Jonah tries not to, and God shows himself bigger and stronger than Jonah, and eventually Jonah ends up there. And the message Jonah brings is, repent, in three days God's going to wipe this place out. It's not people he knew intimately. He knew their reputation, but he didn't know their names individually. He didn't know their stories. He just shows up and says, in three days, God's going to wipe this place out. Now, God told Jonah to do that, very specifically. I would say that's the exception, not the rule. That's why it's in the Bible. It doesn't happen too often. I wouldn't try that where you're living. If you don't repent, God's going to wipe this place out in three days. If God didn't give you that word, don't go saying it. The more common way is for us to join God on a mission, to see where God is leading us, and then to settle down in that place. That's what Paul did. He would go to a city, and he would show up at the synagogue, and he would have conversation with the religious people, and he would talk to them about uh, their history and their understanding of Scripture, and then he would pull out the gospel and share the intersecting points. Paul gets outside himself. He sees, he understands, it moves him to a place of anger and disgust, and then he responds. How about you? Are you ready to be used for the sake of the kingdom? Are you ready to join God on a mission in the life of someone you know or love? Can you get outside yourself? Are you willing to spend a little time, like an investigator, to, to see what it is they spend their time and their energy and their life on? What matters to them? Nature? Animals? Outdoors? Books? Ideas? History? Exercise? Philosophy? Family? Politics? Travel? Education? Baseball, hometown, making money, guns, work, family. These aren't simply categories. I've just described to you people we know. What do they worship? What matters to them? Are you taking time to understand? Paul didn't go to Athens to be a missionary. He went to Athens waiting for his team to show up. But while he was there... 
he couldn't help but notice what was going on around him and to compare it to what he experienced and knew was true. Where will you be waiting today? Who will walk into your life this week? And what are you doing while you wait? It may be the, in, the activity you least want to be doing this week when God shows up. It may be that you're not an outdoor person and you end up going on a nature walk. And while you're there, you come back and you say, I had the best time. It may be that when your workplace opens back up, you think, I don't want to go back there again. I don't want to see those people. I don't like those people. That may be the very place the Spirit is ready to show up. In his new stand-up special, Jerry Seinfeld says, nobody wants to be anywhere anymore. If we're home, we want to go out. If we're out, we want to go home. I think he's right. You wanted to get to church this morning, but now some of you are thinking, when will this be over? Me too, by the way. But hold on. If we're only focused on what's next, we miss the now. Where's the Spirit working now? And how might I be involved now before I get to the next thing? If I go to church on the screen or in the building, looking for the Spirit, grace might explode here. If I go to the computer or the phone or the tablet looking for God on a mission, I might get to join and see a friend or a family member collide with Jesus. And if I join God on a mission, I'm telling you the truth now, listen to me, this isn't just a sermon I'm writing, it's personal experience. If you join God on a mission, you will find that there is nothing better, nothing more fulfilling. Why? Because that's what we were created for. This missionary life, this question, these questions of a missionary, this stance of a missionary, this investigating of a missionary, what's their life like, what matters to them, where do they intersect with the gospel, where is their life different from the gospel, being on a mission where you live, it's the life of a missionary, being sent, joining God where God is at work. Notice two more things with me. First, Paul doesn't just look at what the Athenians are doing and say, hey, that's great, keep going. After the story, he starts to tell parts of the gospel story that don't really match up to their lives. For instance, verse 24, he talks about the fact that God does not live in shrines made by human hands. That's a big deal to them because they had shrines all over the place. When he says, I can see you're a very religious people, that may not have been a compliment. He wanted to help them reduce their gods, become really efficient, and just work it down to one. He doesn't live in shrines made by human hands. We've become aware of that in a whole new way recently, haven't we? I have not heard a lot of complaining out of this congregation, but I have friends who uh, have parishioners and congregation members who've been really bothered that the church was not open, as if somehow the church can't be the church if the church building's not open. You haven't been complaining like that, but let me just say to you, COVID-19 and governor's orders and whatever else might come along does not end the church or change the church mission. Can we be the church with the building closed? Yes. The church isn't the building. This season may change the method we use to carry out our mission, but the mission stays the same. As Pastor Jay Height says, the why has not changed. Why we do what we do has not changed. The mission stays the same. It is, say it with me here at Chelsea Nazarene, growing, serving, reaching together as followers of Jesus Christ. Let me give you one quick example. I didn't ask for her permission, but I saw it on a public Facebook post. So Jen Cody, I'm assuming it's okay to share. I saw a picture Jen had taken. It was a pad of paper. And at the top of the pad of paper, it said, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And then underneath the picture, Jen described the picture by saying, it's something I made for my best friend. I make them with your personal favorite Bible verse. Isn't that awesome? Complicated? No. But totally her. Totally telling. Totally reaching as a follower of Jesus Christ. So what do you and I have to offer today? 
it's not just buildings. There are buildings everywhere. Who cares about the building? I mean, we're thankful for it, but that's not what we offer. We don't offer political pundits and quotes that we hear off of the radio. That's not what we have to offer. We don't offer economic philosophies about saving the economy. We don't offer uh, social health and keeping people clean and social distance. Those are not unimportant things, but they're not what we have to offer. We have more than that. So did Paul. We have a mission. We have a God on a mission who came to us and a God on a mission who sends us. Paul tells the gospel story, not only places where it intersects and parallels with the stories of others, but the parts where that story will complete our life or come against our life. Paul ends with resurrection. How do people respond there in Acts 17? Well, the way we respond sometimes, or the way others respond, some mock him. Resurrection, come on, Paul. And some are willing to hear more. Tell us more about that, Paul. He's done it before, and he'll do it again. As one of our own poets says, when we have a difficult moment, put on the robe and speak the truth. Put on the responsibility of being a nation of priests and tell people using your pad of paper or however it is you tell the story. Paul tells the story, not only the parts that are easy for them to hear, but the parts that are difficult for them to hear. The second thing, notice this with me. Paul uses their own culture to help tell the story. In verse 28, he gives two quotes, and neither of them are scripture until he says it. Now they're in Acts 17 for us. But, but these, these, these words were not found in the Old Testament, the scripture that Paul had. In him we live and move and have our being. It's true. But it wasn't scripture. Or as one of your own poets, he says to them, have said, we too are his offspring. Again, not scripture until Paul uses them. So here's a question. What would it be like for you and me, after we've done this investigating of a, of a sister, of a wife, of a friend, of a cousin, or of a co-worker, to know what it is they like and they care about and what they worship, what would it be like for you and me to reach into the, the culture of that person and highlight pieces of God's story right there using things they love. Are they a country music fan? What if you quoted a, a line from Johnny Cash's song, Ring of Fire, that talks about overwhelming love? Do they spend their time watching movies, Disney movies? Find a piece of dialogue from Lion King or Frozen 2 that talks about sacrifice for others. Are they a sports fan? Find a story of their favorite team or favorite athlete and describe an intersection between the kingdom of God and something this person cares about. The point is, Paul doesn't quote scripture here. Now, that doesn't mean he never quotes it. In other instances, he does. So that doesn't mean we should never quote it. But there are moments, especially in this culture, in this age, where people are biblically illiterate, that starting off by saying, this is what scripture says, this book of the Bible, this chapter, this verse, that may not be the most effective way, and Paul doesn't do it here. He uses quotes and poems from their own world, their own experience, and like a giant verbal highlighter, he says, here is God at work in your life. And he does this with hopefulness and patience. When I was a kid, the only model of telling or showing the good news, the only model of evangelism that I had, came to me as a prepackaged sales pitch. Say this, say this, say this, and get them to do that. Now, I have to tell you, I know a lot of people who came to faith that way. But it's not the only example of sharing your faith. As I've gotten older and paid more attention, there are a lot of different models of how to share the story of God with people around me. Paul gives us one here. One of my favorite examples comes from a man named Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary, a career missionary, and he said this, stand next to me and see if you don't see what I see. What a great way to tell the story of Jesus. Are you willing to do that this week? To ask somebody to stand next to you? This is very personal to me. I've done it, and I'm doing it, and I want to be better at it. 
Can you say that? I've done it. Maybe you haven't done it yet. I'm doing it. Maybe you say, I'm going to do it, and I want to get better at it. We can all say that, can't we? If you can't say that yet, I'm asking you to start the journey today, right now. Let's speak to God in prayer. I'll give you a few moments. I'll be silent for a few moments and let you respond. If there's a particular response that the Spirit of God is calling out of you in this moment, would you just have a conversation right where you're at, responding to the Spirit? As we've been silent here for these 10 or 15 seconds, I just had names and faces of family members and friends just kind of flooding through my mind, just saying their name to God. Would you just say, God, give me an opportunity this week. Help me be prepared. In our talking about God, our theology, there's a concept we call prevenient grace before. It's the grace that goes before. It says before you and I are aware, before you and I show up or are ready, God has already been at work. Think about that. Would you thank God for prevenient grace in your own life? Before you were on the face of the earth, God had people prepared, saints prepared to show you the way. Would you say, God, thank you for prevenient grace. Now take another 10 or 15 seconds and dream a little bit. Let the Spirit infuse your dream. Where will prevenient grace show up next? Where is prevenient grace already at work? And if you were aware and available and ready, God might lead you and say to you, let me show you what I've already been doing. Now would you say in your prayer, God, I want to make myself available to you. Use me in whatever way you want in the life of this person. And be reminded today, would you please, God is not only interested in what you can do in the life of that person, God is interested in how this interaction will be forming and shaping you. So would you say, God, Prepare me to be of use to you, but also do a work in me here, now. Now let's turn our prayers to a little bit wider focus. For those who are sick or injured, bring healing. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are lonely, bring companionship and community. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are facing layoffs, the end of contracts, reduced pay or income, bring provision, bring peace. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who get up and go to work every day, facing stress, concerned about what they may be bringing home to family, Would you bring comfort, bring courage? In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are decision makers in our government, in our economy, in our schools, and in our churches, and in other aspects of society, bring wisdom. May they be led by you, whether they know it or not. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For unspoken needs right now that are are across our church family, needs that haven't been verbalized by me today, but burdens that are being carried by your children, your saints, in this moment. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And God, we give thanks for people who carry the burden, the responsibility, praying for others. God, to you, we give thanks. For times and places we've been aware of you, even today, 
or this past week, God, to you, we give thanks. For times and places where we've been unaware of you, and yet you've been present and active just the same. God, to you, we give thanks. The past that has helped us to know you are not a God limited by what we can think of or ask for, that you're not limited by space or time or resources. God, to you, we give thanks. For the gifts you have given the church, such as finances and buildings, yes, but also for those who've gone before us and those who come after us, for the spirit at work in us, for the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. God, to you, we give thanks. For the gift of prayer, and the specific prayer your son taught us to pray, God, we give thanks to you, and we together say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing a song that's been around for a while. The title of it is Rock of Ages. Um, the story behind the, the hymn is this. The person who wrote the song, he had a great name. His name was Augustus Toplady. Um, and Augustus was a pastor in a nearby village, and one day he was walking through a gorge in England, and as this preacher was walking through the gorge from a nearby village to the gorge, traveling along, he was caught in a storm, and he was looking for a place to get out of the rain. Actually, right now, as, as, as the service is going on, it's raining outside where we're at. And Augustus looked for shelter, a place to get out of the rain and the storm. And he was safe in this rock, in this cleft of the rock. As Noah and Tammy come, I'm curious to know this morning, where in your life are you looking for protection? Where are you looking for the rock of ages to be immovable and faithful and trustworthy for you? Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from your wounded side, which flowed, be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill your lost demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin. You must save and you alone. You must save and you alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Desperate come. Helpless look to you for grace. Bow I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath. When my eyes shall close
was in death when I soar to worlds unknown and see you upon your throne, rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. 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 Let me hide. From 1 Peter 3, my prayer for you is this, that you would always be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are. And you do it with the utmost courtesy and gentleness. And that you would be like your leader, Jesus, who kept a clear conscience before God so that when people threw mud, none of it was able to stick. He suffered because of others' sins, the righteous one for the, the, righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through it all. He was put to death and then made alive to bring us to God. May you be being made like him, made righteous, brought to God, and being used to bring others to God. We pray this in the name of the resurrected Christ and God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.